people settling in. There's water on the side. Uh, welcome to How Hacking Changed My Perspective on Building Applications. Late. Uh, <laughs> we'll point everybody out that's late for this. Uh, and this is uh, basically a talk where I'm not getting technical in detail about you know, what SQL injection is and what cross-site scripting is, but more of a Here's what I've learned. Uh, you know, I started out as a developer and I switched into security consulting uh, about five years ago and you know, tested a lot of applications. I've learned a lot of stuff about building applications. And so with this, I want to talk about some of the things we've seen, some of the fails we've seen, and things that we can take away from that as developers from a holistic point of view versus just looking at specific code. Um, this is more of kind of a high level view of it, but I think it'll be kind of interesting. It's, kind of, it's the first time I've done a talk similar to this, we're much more on how to hack stuff. Here we're going to talk about kind of the effects of how we've hacked stuff and what we've seen. And I think I bring a unique perspective to this because I come from development, right? So some of these examples are stuff that I've, they're not actually examples of what I did, but I've done stuff very similar to this. Uh, and you know, I'm not proud of it, but it's happened. So <laughs> hopefully this will be uh, enjoyable for everybody. Uh, so quickly about me. My name is James Jardine. Uh, I run my own company. I used to do software, but now we focus on application security. So I help organizations build their application security programs, test their applications, and provide security education to application team members. I'm an instructor, presenter, uh, presented at a lot of different places, uh, but really all that matters on this slide, uh, I do a lot of blogging and podcasting. So some of this blogging and podcasting, most of it is, is really based on security. Uh, but this one down here, the developsec.com, this is actually based for more of the application teams, not the security community, but it's more security for application teams. So it's a good resource to check out if you're interested in that type of stuff. So my early years, as I said, I started out as a developer um, in the wonderful world of VB6. Everybody remember that? That was good stuff. ASP Classic. You know, using Visual Interdev. I know, too, people too young for this stuff. <laughs> it's not like I'm talking about really old stuff. I didn't use punch cards, okay? But <laughs> old school, and, you know, and start out, I switched over to .NET uh, in the beta versions, and I've used .NET as my main programming, if I program as my language <laughs> since. Uh, so mostly .NET, uh, pretty knowledgeable about .NET. But when I started building applications, it was really more about building functionality. Who in here, I mean, that's what our focus is, right? We're trying to solve problems for our company, right? We're trying to build something, and I want to make sure that it works. But we're starting to see a shift in that when we talk about security, because we're looking at different angles of how we want to look at applications. And that's hopefully what we're going to cover here, because we were, I was learning as much as I could. I mean, I was digging into MSDN. Do people even use MSDN anymore? They do, okay. I mean, I remember, I mean, I'd go home, I'd be reading MSDN, I mean, I'd be digging all into this. You know, I knew as much as I could about .NET as I was going through it. You know, I mean, I remember working with a lady that, I worked with her for a year. We were .NET shop, and she comes in one day, she'd been studying for, I don't know, the MCSD or the MC, I don't think they had MCP at that point, but, you know, one of those certifications, and she's like, did you know that .NET compiles down to IL? And I was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> You're a .NET developer, I can't believe you don't. And you came from Java. This is a new concept, right, with bytecode. Uh, but I was learning as much as I could. I wanted to know how systems worked. And that helps me out in a security standpoint as well. But we didn't know security at that point. Security existed. SQL injection existed. All these things existed. My first introduction as I was going through training for development was <laughs> I had a simple form. It was actually a Windows form. And this really wasn't a security flaw, but we had a Windows form during class. We're like, here, go ahead, you know, build up this thing. And, and this is similar to it, right? Take in the first name, last name, age, date of birth, simple stuff. And I was like, great, I'm done. Check it out. And I coded this form up. And I wasn't expecting that my instructor would come along and put something different than an age in my fields. And I was, I mean, I was upset, right? Like, why would you do this? It clearly says age. Right? I mean, from a development standpoint, that's how we look at it. I said age, put an age in there. Why wouldn't you put an age in there? But, of course, he didn't put an age in there. <laughs> he put something else in there. And I was greeted with typecasting issues. I just grabbed this off the internet, by the way. <laughs> it's not actually the error message. But right, some sort of conversion issue that, 
At the time, I didn't think of it as a security issue. I just thought of it as, oh, you, you broke my app. This isn't cool. Uh, I wasn't happy about it, but whatever. You know, I, okay, I'll check this stuff, and we'll do some more error handling, and, and we'll deal with it. But I look back now, and I think, no, this is actually my first introduction to security of people aren't going to put what you want into that box. You know, don't expect that because you put date of birth, they're going to put date of birth. There's a whole community of people out there that purposely want to put something other than date of birth in there. You know, and .NET, we don't have as much a problem. Java, we don't have the problem of buffer overflows, things like that. But, you know, older systems, or you're dealing with Perl, you're dealing with some of the other things, they're putting, you know, 50,000 A's in there to see if they can cause some buffer overflow to get it to do something, right? We're not expecting that. So I started to learn, like, hey, look, we have to have some form of input validation, which I was actually doing here because I tried the cast and it didn't work. <laughs> so I was starting on the right path and then moved on. Well, what about SQL injection? When I started development, that was back in 2000, SQL injection existed, but we didn't know about it. I mean, I didn't know about it. And I, anybody I worked with, we didn't know what SQL injection was. All we knew was is that we had to make SQL calls and we would escape characters right, in SQL queries because it would break our code. Right? Not because of security. And that was the problem. And I think we still have that problem today is that a lot of people still look at it as, I do this because it breaks my code, not because it's a security issue. So an example here, right? This is broken functionality. I put in the last name O'Reilly, and of course I get a SQL error message. And this was me, I mean, 2001, you'd get this error and you're like, ah. Oh, you know, I can't believe somebody put something with a single quote in there. Let me go back and fix this. And I would escape the single quote, which isn't the end all be all for SQL injection, by the way, but it solved our problem. We weren't looking at it from a different perspective. Now, as a hacker, I look at it as, hey, look, I can actually manipulate that and do much more than a single quote, right? I can do a single quote or one equals one and actually pull back much more data. Right? And so that's the difference between how we're looking at things from a hacking standpoint versus how we look at things from a development standpoint. Development, I'm looking at, I just need to solve a problem. I need a form to be able to query something, and I need to make sure that it doesn't break. From a hacker, I'm saying, you have a form that queries something, and I know there's other data in there, and I want it. So how can I get it? Right? And there's a lot that has to go into that. I have to understand, as a security side and the hacking side, how do I handle SQL queries? How do I attack those? There's lots of different ways to attack SQL queries. I need to understand how to do it. If anybody's seen anything about SQL injection, anybody here know what SQL injection is? I mean, everybody's got an idea what it is. The common thing is or one equals one, uh, although typically it's dash dash at the end, right, for the comment for, C, uh, for SQL Server. Uh, this actually happens to be running on a Linux box with MySQL in the back. So that's why we have the hashtag for a different comment. But how many times have you seen a report come through where you got SQL Server uh, or SQL injection on it? Uh, how many people have pen test reports done on their software? A few, that's good. I do that stuff, by the way, for all you that didn't raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> if you've had these come through, right, you see it and they're like, oh yeah, we put or one equals one in there. I can't tell you how many people go through and they code their system to look for one equals one and they delete it. And then we come through and we put two equals two and we get all our values again, right? Because we didn't understand the flaw. We didn't understand, we just said, oh, that's the attack string. That's the payload. Let me fix that, right? And so we need to start looking at it as a bigger thing of, it's not just exactly what the example is, but I need to understand the flaw. And if I understood SQL injection, I'd know one equals one isn't the only way to do this. I could do A equals A, anything that comes up true we'll do this exact same thing, right? So we wanna make sure that we're fixing this in the right way. Another example I have of this, right? Simple contact form, right? We look at this as I'm gonna be able to provide my email address and a message, right? Maybe I'm gonna contact the company, provide them some feedback. Hey, your website's pretty cool. You know, contact me for more information. I get my information in there and I send it up. Pretty simple concept. Well. What happens if I actually look at the request that goes up for that, and I see that, well, we used hidden fields to determine the to address, so it's not on the server saying, hey, send this to contact us at company AYZ.com, 
but you're passing it up in the request. And this may seem like something that's basic, right? That nobody's gonna do this. I've been, I will tell you right now, I've seen this within the past few months, where they're passing up everything you need for that email in the request from the browser. Which from a hacking standpoint, I just found myself an open relay. I can now send emails from anything I want to anybody I want, whatever subject I want, whatever body I want. When you talk about spamming emails, when you talk about phishing emails, this is where I'm going. Because it's coming from your server, not mine, right? And as a hacker, I don't want to get caught. <laughs> so I'm going to go use your stuff. I don't want to use my stuff. And this is very common. <clears throat> we see a lot of stuff you know, coming out where when we see those requests come up, but we're not thinking about that. We're, we looked at it as I create a contact form for somebody to reach out to us. You know, and the easy way to do it was, let me just put a hidden field in there of the from address. Let me put a hidden field for the to address. Maybe even hide the subject. And all they're putting in is the body. But if I can control that, that matters. So that's what we're looking at. So the big lesson here is, from that standpoint, we need to consider what may be possible with what we're doing. All right, we're building a lot of complex applications and we're building it to perform a certain functionality, but what else could we do with that? And that's kind of be a theme as we go through this, because a bunch of these examples are gonna be, look what else was possible with the functionality you gave us. And so to start kind of that, don't rely on the browser. Don't rely on my awesome images and change of fonts either. Uh, <laughs> we can't rely on the browser, right? I, I just read something, I was looking up uh, the Electron talk that just happened yesterday. I was like, oh, that looks pretty interesting. And I looked up Electron and I clicked on their security link and it says, you know, oh, well, you know, because this is hosted internally, we don't have the browser to fall back on for our security needs. And I was like, whew, I don't know if you have the browser anyway as a web developer, but we can't just rely on the browser. There's so much more that we see. But when we're using an application, when we look at it from a user perspective, all we see is the browser. You could be loading up 50,000 other requests behind that thing, but I see the browser, right? So I see what you want me to see. From a hacker standpoint, I see what I want to see, and that's anything you pass down from your server. And there's lots of tools that help us do this. One of the most common ones you'll see from a security testing standpoint, this here is a picture of Burp Suite, which is a proxy. Anybody here use proxies? A couple of people use proxies. Do you guys use Fiddler mostly? Yeah, okay. Um, Fiddle is another one, right? One's on Windows. Burp, uh, it's written in Java, so it runs on any platform. Uh, same thing with the OWASP Zap that's over there. And basically, it's a way for me to intercept every request response between your machine and the server, right? So no matter what you're sending back and forth, I can see all that, right? And that causes a problem for us because everything we thought was hidden, <laughs> everything you know that we thought people people not going to see this. Well, we can see it. I mean, this is actually a screenshot of me just calling my public website, uh, which, yes, it's WordPress. If you can read the tiny print, everybody dogs on WordPress. I actually like it quite a bit. Uh, but look at all the requests that are actually happening just for me to display my homepage. But as the end user, all I see is that front thing, right? As most QA testers, what do we see? Just that front request. I see a request that's in the address bar and that's it. I don't see iframe requests. I don't see requests to CSS. I don't see requests to JavaScript. All I see is the page that comes back. Well, how much information could possibly be hidden in all these other requests? Right? And that's what we're looking for from a security perspective is, what else are you passing me down? Let me look at that and see. You know, we have uh, lots of examples where you know, we go look at a website. How many people are using JSON responses to send their data back down? right, to be able to populate their screen. How many people send more data than they populate on that screen? A lot of people, right? I mean, I've come across websites where when that data comes down, I mean, they've got social security numbers, they've got credit card numbers, they've got birth dates, anything a hacker could love to see. But they're like, but I don't display it on screen. Or a great one, and you always check the responses, is if they mask the social security number. So you see, you know, you load it up and it pulls down the social security number, but you only see the last four. And then you go look and they're doing that all client side. And sure enough, if you see the response come back, there's the social security number full blown. So you can get it, right? But we don't think about that typically as development because it's not visible 
right? To the, to the human eye, I guess. It's kind of hidden in the back. But this is common. CNN, and it was really more of a discuss issue, right? But, you know, everybody's got comments on their pages. And one of their issues, and this was years ago, would discuss they had it configured wrong. So, you know, <clears throat> you're supposed to be anonymous and we're not going to tell you who, you know, other commenters who you are so we can write the nastiest things possible and nobody knows it was us, you know, and you'd look at the comments and it would display your username, the date the comment will post it in the comment. But if you actually looked at the response that came back in the JSON, they had your IP address, they had some other information about you that actually we could figure out who you were, right? So you weren't as anonymous as you thought you were. Right? And they weren't thinking, you know, I mean, obviously it was a configuration mistake, and, but a lot of these things are simple mistakes that as we're just going through, it's like, oh, I didn't think of that. You know, I, I misconfigured that. And so another example uh, of using tools, because there was lots of tools on here, All right? Skipfish, Nikto, uh, the one I'm going to talk about next, SQL Map. But we, we have tons of tools as, as testers, as hackers. And it's funny to me that we don't use a lot of them as developers and QA because these things are built to find security and a lot of them are simple to use they're automated tools you just run them uh, but an example of SQL map anybody heard of SQL map before so SQL map helps us automate the exploitation of SQL server so if I go back a few slides and I see where I found that SQL injection right like oh I found SQL injection I take that link I plug it into SQL map I click a button and it does some magic behind the scenes and all of a sudden it says, hey, here's the list of databases that are on that server. And then you say, okay, well, let me see database one. Here's a list of tables that are on that database. All right, let me see you know, all the data for that. And you can dump all the data. I mean, you're in and out, you're quick as can be, and you're good to go, right? I mean, you can, you can dump a SQL database like that. And it's impressive, right? And it's, when I test, that's the only time I use SQL map is when I actually find a SQL injection, and then I'll use it to speed the process. Um, I don't actually use it to find them, but I'll use it to exploit it, because it's just quicker. Well, I came across the situation, we were testing this a couple years ago, and we found a SQL injection flaw in the, the customer site. They were, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it was actually an airport, <laughs> kind of interesting, but they were hosting on a major hosting provider. You know, so I mean, lots of, lots of sites on here. And I didn't realize that at first, until I found the SQL injection and loaded up SQL map, and I got in, and I pulled the list of databases, and I saw somebody I used to work for, uh, their database in there, and I was like, I know who this is. And so I'm like, great. But of course, right, we're limited. I mean, I'm not a you know, black hat hacker over here. Limited in scope to just hacking my company. So I go in, I exploit their database, I pull, I'll dump all their data, I'm good. I kind of keep moving on. I go to run Nick2, and I don't run a lot of automated tools, but I was like, ah, just fire it up just to see if there's anything out there. And about midway through Nick2, all of a sudden I get blocked. Like, I can't get to the site. I mean, I'm done. And so I reach out to some coworkers. I'm like, have you guys ever been blocked with Nick2? I've never seen Nick2 get blocked. And they're like, no, we've never seen it. And then it kind of hit me. I was like, oh man, I said, I just own that place with SQL injection. I bet they finally caught on, and they did. They caught on to me stealing all the data, and they blocked me. Well, they didn't catch me stealing the data, but they caught all the SQL injection going on. And so they blocked my IP address, which was unfortunate, because I'd already stolen all the data. <laughs> right, so it shows that the controls that we may have in place may not be quite quick enough, right? I mean, we have to understand that when I'm gonna exploit SQL injection, I'm not gonna do it one line at a time. I'm not typing in every one of those things to try to enumerate your database. Even if it's blind SQL injection where I can't see actual error messages coming back and I have to enumerate through a lot of stuff, I'm using a tool that's gonna automate this. And, and if you actually saw SQL map work, it's quick. Like the speed it comes back with your databases and data is ridiculous. So we're not doing it that way. So we can't make the assumption that if somebody's gonna attack us, they're gonna be doing it real slow. You know, oh, it'll take me, it'll take them forever to run all those queries to steal it. No, it won't, it won't at all. It's gonna be quick. Uh, the downside to this, they detected me, they blocked my IP, uh, and it took about two and a half months for them to unblock my IP, uh, which was a problem only in the sense that this was a major hosting provider, <laughs> which means there were a lot of sites I couldn't get to from my current house because of the block on my IP address. 
And lo and behold, you can imagine, I reached out to them. And I was like, hey, hosting provider, you blocked my IP address. I was performing a test for a client who's hosted with you. Can you unblock me? They're like, no. <laughs> They're like, you have to reach out to your client. They have to fill out a form. They have to submit it to us so that way we know that you're legit. Because can you believe they wouldn't just trust somebody that said they just hacked their stuff and unblocked my IP address? So kudos to them. I won't tell you who they are, but they are a big hosting provider. But it was just, you know, we have to think about that when we're going through this stuff that we can do stuff fast, right? And, and with all the tools that are out there, uh, you know, things go by quick. The other thing we need to think about is, you know, and I kind of alluded to this, nothing's really hidden. You know, I mean, we might think of, well, we can use view source to view our HTML that's coming back, but there's so much more information, uh, like I said, all those requests that are coming back down that we have to think about. You know, it's not just what comes down in our view source. Now, view source is great because, you know, we can sit there and see things like view state. Anybody here a, a web form, .NET web forms? Not a lot of people raising their hands. I see a couple heads shaking, MVC. All right, a couple more, sorry about that. Um, I, I, I come from web forms, so I don't like MVC at all. <laughs> it's just not my thing, I like web forms. But anybody that's used .NET web forms, right, they have view state, which is only base64 encoded, uh, even though most developers will try to tell you that it's encrypted and you can't see it, because when you go in to view source, it is unreadable. Right? But it takes one line of code to be able to decode view state. I was actually doing a test, uh, actually, ironically, same airport. <laughs> Man, they didn't do so well, did they? Internal assessment, and I came across a website. I was like, oh, look at this, a website. So I go poking around with it, I view source, I see they've got view state in there, I decode their view state. Now, this is a website that had archives of some form of data, right? So, 2008, 2009, 2010. All right, great. I open up view state. There is a connection string for every year that they had data for. And when I say connection string, I mean the full SQL connection string of user ID, password, database, like everything I needed. So of course, I fired up SQL browser and I went over and I went into every one of those databases and I started combing through and seeing what type of information they had in there, right? But view state. We thought it was encoded, we didn't understand it. <clears throat> so we have to start understanding our frameworks a little bit more. Uh, I've run into other ones where we had RACF uh, passwords in view state that we were passing back down to clients. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no, we can't do that. Uh, lots, you know, so that kind of goes into the common encodings. I kind of mentioned a little bit on the JSON responses, right? I mean, this is a common thing where we have that, where we send too much information back down. And again, we don't see it, so we think, oh, well, nobody else is gonna see this, right? This is behind the scenes. We use HTTPS so they can't view our connections. Uh, Yet yeah, we can view all that. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, mobile developers in here, a couple of mobile developers, right? It doesn't matter whether this is mobile, whether this is web, uh, Windows typically, right? We can put a proxy in between just about anything and be able to view this data. Uh, now we do get a little bit more difficult. Uh, if you do mobile development or desktop development, if you're doing anything like cert pinning, anybody heard of cert pinning? Where you can actually tie your app and say, look, I'm only gonna connect over HTTPS if the cert matches our cert. Uh, that makes it much more harder and difficult to actually intercept that data. Uh, I'm not a fan of testing applications that have cert pinning because it's a real pain. Because <laughs> then you actually have to root your device and you know, tell it don't, just ignore the cert pinning and all that stuff, but it, it makes it much more difficult, but there's downsides to cert pinning, because cert pinning in a big corporation, we run through a proxy, right? How many people in a big corporation, they're forced, all their traffic goes out through a proxy, the corporate proxy? Well, if you cert pin, then you get their certificate because they're trying to read all your traffic and then your app doesn't work. So there are definitely some issues there. Another spot where we see a lot of issues Bad forgot passwords. <laughs> this is unfortunate, but uh, you know, forgot password can be difficult. I've seen a lot of people struggle with being able to do forgot password. This is one of those features that you, know, you really have to kind of think about it because most of the time in forgot password, you're, you're suffering from username harvesting type flaws. 
you know, you've, you've come through, you enter in username or your email address, and then you click a button and it says, oh, a mail has been sent, if we're lucky. But if you've got an invalid username, it says, that's an invalid username, or this username doesn't exist on the system. So now we've got invalid, you know, username harvesting, so I can start grabbing valid usernames, and there's tons of stuff I could do with that, right? If we look at that and break it down, if I take invalid usernames versus valid usernames, then I can start attacking the login screen, right? Uh, even if you have lockout, you know, I can take those valid usernames and start running against it and say, all right, I'm gonna take all these valid usernames and I'm gonna these two passwords. Top two passwords, known to man, we're gonna run everybody through those top two. And you'd be surprised how many people will actually fall to that because people are not very creative with their passwords. <laughs> I could also use it for spamming, right? And phishing attacks where I know you're a user of XYZ site, right? You're a user of the Jardine software site. I can send you emails directly and say, hey, I know you're a user of Jardine software site. We're doing X. And then you go through it, right? So there's lots of things we can do with username harvesting. Uh, to start to uh, kind of attack this stuff. So with the bad forgot password here, this is actually something that happened not too long ago where user enters their username, right? We're going everything client side these days. User enters their username. Uh, if it's correct, your secret questions are displayed. You answer the secret question and then it allows you to enter a new password. The problem. <laughs> At this point here, when the secret questions were displayed, they returned back the secret question and the secret answer. <laughs> and then when they validated it, they validated it client side, because we don't want an extra tip to the server to validate whether your answer was right. So they just validate right there on the client, and if it was right, they let you set your new password. So if you had anybody's username, you could reset anybody's password because they gave you the answer, right? But, and they, they weren't thinking that, right? They were just looking at, it's gonna be easier, it's quicker if we don't have to go back to the server, let's just pass it down. No, didn't work so well, right? I mean, and that's a pretty high flaw. I mean, I can get into anybody's account in a situation like that, and all it took was me looking through Burp uh, or Fiddler or whatever your proxy tool is to just analyze those responses and say, the answer's coming back. You know, because I'm sitting there looking at it, like, how, how does this work? Why, how are they validating this without another request? And then you see, oh, they're giving me the answer back. This is awesome. You know, and so you have to have the conversation and talk about it. And that's one of the things I talk about with a lot of my clients, you know, is when you find something like this, it's not just, hey, this is broken, you need to go fix this. But let's talk about your functionality. Uh, when we actually came across this, we completely changed how this forgot password worked. It no longer was you immediately get displayed your secret questions. Uh, it changed to a more secure format where no matter what you did, invalid or valid username, it would give you a message that a message was sent to you. And then, you know, if it was valid, you actually got a message. If it wasn't, you didn't. So we eliminated username harvesting. Then the message you received had a token, a one-time use token, it was short-lived. So you could click it. You can only use it once, once you use it, it's done. So even if somebody gets your email account, that token, they can't reset your password later. Click the token, then it takes you to your super secret questions that can probably be answered on Facebook. Once you answer those, then you can change your password. Right, and so there was multiple steps. We took it out of band by going through email. There was lots of things. But you see a lot of forgot passwords that are, that are straightforward like this, right? As soon as I put in my username, if it's valid, here's my questions. And then if I answer those questions, Here's the password, right? There's no out of band. There's nothing that, that makes it more difficult. And this isn't a difficult system to rearrange, but if you've already architected like this, I mean, this can be a big change. You know, a lot of places will come in and say, ah, just change it to this. Here's a flow chart, no big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big change. The other thing we need to think about is everything is a target. You know, it doesn't matter how small your app is, doesn't matter how benign your app is. Right, we can't think of, well, my, you know, it's just the corporate website, or you know, we don't do anything big, we're not a big bank. Right? Everything is a target. And when hackers are looking at stuff, we use these things as launching points for a lot of different things. Right? You could have the simplest of websites out there, but if I know that there's a certain audience that goes to your website, then you are value to me. Even if you don't have PII, you don't have credit card information, you don't have any of that stuff, 
if you're someplace that common people go, maybe I'm targeting government, and I know that your site, maybe it's a forum, maybe it's something else that government goes to look stuff up, certain government employees, and they had this, uh, it was actually the State Department, I think, maybe not the State Department, maybe I'm just thinking of them because they're all in the news, uh, but it was one of those departments where they had a site they would go to, and somebody knew it, and they found a flaw in that site. So when those employees would go check something out on that site, their machine would get popped, right? And it, it's what we call a watering hole attack. It's kind of interesting, right? I mean, all I think about is a crocodile sitting in the water waiting for a gazelle to snap out. But it's a watering hole attack, right? We've picked a spot. I know you're coming here, so I'm going to sit here and wait. And as soon as you get here, I'm in, all right? And there's a lot we can do once we grab your browser. Uh, much more than I think you think <laughs> once we get a hold of your browser. So it doesn't matter that you're just a, some small benign site, right? Like everything we're working on actually matters. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, we're too small to be hacked. You know, nobody cares about us. But I will t I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not going to go after a Wells Fargo. I'm not going to go after a Bank of America, right? These guys spend, I mean, they had some numbers come out. I mean, they're, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year on cybersecurity. Why would I attack them? The logging that they're doing, right? The, the stuff that they've got in place, they're pretty hardened. Could you get in? Possibly. But it seems like a bad move. But if I can find somebody small that actually talks to them in the back end, I'm going to go after them. Because they don't have the big budgets. They don't have the security. They don't have all that stuff. I'm going to attack them, and then I'm going to move over. All right, you see, I mean, the target hack that happened a couple years ago, right? I and mean, they talk about, well, they attacked the HVAC vendor and then from there moved over, right? I'm not going straight after target. Rare that I'm going to find something directly in them. But if I can find somebody that does business with them and with Internet of Things and all these things, right? We're throwing thermostats in on our networks. We're throwing all kinds of stuff in here. I mean, people popping up random wireless APs so that way they can host their thermostat and control it from their vendor location. I mean weird stuff happening. But that's our entry point, right? So you can't think of yourself, oh, I'm just an HVAC guy. You're an HVAC guy with an inside in to all these big corporations because they let you manage your stuff from your location, right? You can monitor their networks. You know, I, we're not network people, right? But I can tell you right now, most companies don't segment their networks like we'd hope they would, right? That's why we see people get in from a card terminal, you know, at the store location and popping stuff all the way through their thing, right? Because they're not segmenting their stuff out. So an example of the innocent corp site, uh, and you know, we have this conversation, I have it with uh, clients, you know, they talk about, oh, well, we're not really concerned about, you know, that corp site that's hosted out on web.com, you know, it's just our branding site. But we actually do look at this because we can look at phishing emails, even though it's not connected to your production systems, Right, it's still a way for me to attack your systems. And so it was, it was actually funny. I was working from home. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I worked for a different consulting company, testing an airport. <laughs> I don't know why this one's the common theme today. I don't know. I, most of my stories are good, though. They're from there. Uh, but I, I'm sitting there testing, and we're doing phishing. And we're saying, OK, you know, we're going to you know, attack these couple people. We're going to send some phishing emails. And I had found a flaw in their public site cross-site scripting, reflective. So I mean, I send you an email, you click it, opens your browser, and then it reports back to me and says, hey, we're connected, let's do some stuff. And uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there getting ready to craft the email. My wife walks in, she's like, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, you know, I'm just crafting this email, you know, I gotta fish this person, you know, see if we can get some information. See if I can get them to click my link, right? It turns into a cool challenge. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know what, this is perfect, I'll use you. So I start crafting the email. Hey, you know, I'm a teacher. My, a colleague of mine told me how you do, you know, lessons where you come in and talk to students about what you do and, and about the airport and this stuff. But the link she gave me is not working. And so I wanted to get some more information about how you guys do this. And, you know, I pasted my link and it's got, you know, all kinds of XSS on the back end. She's like, nobody's going to click that. And I said, I know. You're right. I said, somebody might click this. And so I right click on it and I change the link so it says, you know, the name of the website <laughs> and hides all that other stuff at the end. And as soon as it changed it and the email re updated, she's like, oh, that's shady. She's like, you are shady. She's like, I didn't realize what you did. This is shady. She's like, I'm never clicking a link from you again. 
I said, I'm not going to send it to you. So <laughs> I send it out, you know, and we ended up going off shopping or whatever, and we come back, and sure enough, like the person had clicked. I got an email back from them, and it said, hey, I'm sorry the link didn't work. I don't know why it's not working. I forwarded it over to my system admin so they could check it out. I was like, yes. <laughs> like, this is great, right? But simple website, but it's a way to get in. Now, where would that have led me if we were actually trying to go a lot further with it? Well, I've got somebody now that's on the internal network at that location, behind the firewalls, behind all that stuff that has clicked my link that I now have control of their browser, basically. Uh, have anybody heard of Beef? Uh, it's the browser exploitation framework. Uh, it's written in, I think they updated it to Ruby. Uh, but basically, you take a little JavaScript hook, that's your XSS payload. So basically, the payload I sent her included this hook.js out to my server. So when the page loaded, it loaded that hook. And in that hook, I can, from my interface, I can show alert boxes, I can redirect the page, I can you know, send exploits to actually exploit. Like if she got an outdated version of Flash or anything like that, I can exploit that vulnerability in Flash to gain a foothold on her machine, which at that point, I've now got a machine on the inside of the network, which means now I don't have to worry about that wonderful $100,000 firewall that the company put up in front to keep me out. I'm on the inside. And now whatever she has access to, I have access to. And then most likely, they're running outdated versions of Windows, right? Nobody's running the latest version. So I could probably escalate my privileges and start moving around, right? I've bypassed all that, all from a simple company website. Right, so we have to think about, it doesn't matter how small our project is, it actually could hold much bigger implications because of that access that's giving us into there. So the other thing we have, right, <laughs> don't trust the messenger. Again, this kind of goes back to the browser thing, but we can't trust that browser. Don't think that your client-side script is saving anything. <laughs> client-side means nothing in the hacking world because we're gonna bypass it all using tools like Burp, Right? Even if you've got JavaScript validation, you can't put an age that's not a number in here. Fine, I'll put an actual age in there. And I'll intercept the request, I'll change it to something else, and I'll send it on its way. Right? And so we can't trust what the browser's sending to us. And so I like to talk about trust, because I think a lot of people don't understand trust. Uh, anybody done any type of threat modeling or anything like that? So, I mean, this is a basic, a lot of threat models will have this, right? Where it's a basic kind of layout, right, your UML of what's going on. And here I've got a bunch of trust boundaries set up to kind of show what is untrusted data. Because we oftentimes just think it's user supplied data, right? Like, oh, user supplied data is untrusted. And we drop it at that. But in the conversations I have with people, yes, we have user supplied data coming right from the browser up. And I wouldn't trust that stuff. So that's why we got this red trust boundary coming through. Right, but what about external web services? Do we trust those? I wouldn't, uh, even if you know who they are. As a matter of fact, even if those were internal web services, um, you know, I'd still have a trust boundary there because I don't know who else is calling that. Right? Yeah, I have a trust boundary. What about your database? We trust the database? I mean, it's ours. It's internal, right? Nobody can mess with that except for that SQL injection attack I put in there that could modify data. Or if I'm doing a good job with that, you know, and, and we had this. <laughs> it was funny. A company I worked for, we did all platforms, right? So we had web, Windows, mobile. And the Windows guy did a, or the web guy did a great job of input validation. You couldn't get cross-site scripting past him for nothing. Unfortunately, the mobile people didn't care. <laughs> they would let anything in. So we didn't know, you know, hey, who else is talking to that database? Because the mobile guy let cross-site scripting go up, and then the web guy got owned because he was only doing input validation, right? Because he was like, look, my input validation is good. You're not getting this data in here. But he wasn't thinking that somebody else could put that data in there, right? You've got DBAs and people running scripts against the database, right? We don't trust our database. Uh, in most organizations, they'll consider that against the trust, right? So we have to understand what type of data do we trust. Now, I would trust, you know, configuration files that are sitting there with my system. I trust that. Because to be quite honest with you, if you can get in there and change my configuration file, you can rewrite my app. <laughs> you have access to my source code. I'm OK with that stuff. But anything coming from any external source, we don't know who's going to call it. And you might be able to say, today, nobody else calls this. That's my web database, and nobody else touches it. 
And then tomorrow, some marketing guy is like, you know what would be great? If we had a mobile app that did this. And now all of a sudden, you got somebody else talking to your stuff, right? Same thing, web services. Maybe I control that web service and we're good until somebody else comes along and gets access to it. And now we're not good because we don't know what they're doing. So we have to think about that from a trust standpoint of how that's coming through. So I've got another example of kind of a cool thing that we did. This was uh, not the airport. <laughs> how dare I not have the airport one in here? So this was actually a uh, pretty major financial institution. I guess they consider financial institution uh, where I know, poorly name it the negative highs. But basically what they had was, on their website, they had the ability to buy another piece of security, if you will. Uh, you could purchase something, right? Simple cart. <clears throat> now, they didn't let you set the quantity. They locked you into one. And they had a price set, but the price was uh, pretty locked down. But the quantity was locked down based on a disabled field, uh, which anybody using Firefox can enable any disabled field on your form, right? I mean, that's pretty easy. Uh, disabled field. So they were thinking, you know what? We can trust this. Perfect. So they'd accept the, the quantity as one. You couldn't mess with the price, which is good. And then you could order it. And it would actually pull from your account that has money in it. And, and it would debit the money. Well, what I found was we could change the quantity, because it's just a hidden field, to a negative value. And I used a really big negative value. And sure enough, they took it. Right? They were like, oh, great, negative. Well, what happens when we multiply negatives and positives? <laughs> they stay negative. So what happens when you thought you were about to do a debit? You did a credit. And so an account that started out with $10,000 ended with $90 million. And unfortunately, we weren't able to draw that out and be you know, in a non extraordinary country. Uh, but <laughs> Hence, I'm here, the, the downside of testing, right? But it was very easy to actually do this, right? But it was simple mistakes that they were made, but this is stuff that we often overlook. But I mean, I've had multiple sites that were just like this. I had another site where you go in and order stuff and we were able to quickly ramp up our accounts and the money was validated. I mean, this, this is test system that we were in, but it went through their checks. I mean, it was validated. If this was real life, I could have removed that money and transferred it someplace else and been gone. Uh, and they wouldn't have realized it um, until somebody did some sort of audit check and they said, whoa, wait a minute. This guy bought one of these things for $10 and now he's got $90 million. Now, what happened here? <laughs> Bad checks going on. But that's perfectly possible, right? We can do this type of stuff. Um, so what went wrong, right? We assume the quantity field was hidden uh, and, and it could be modified, right? It was just a hidden field. We'll pass it up. So that's a problem. There was no validation that the transaction was a debit. I'm buying something. I shouldn't be taking money back, you know. I shouldn't be receiving money, I should be sending money. So there's gotta be some checks there to make sure of that. You know, and mentioning some sort of second approval, right? They had people, like it took the next day for it to actually be in my account. Like I had to wait a day before I could say, yes, this worked. Because I had to go through their systems and go through their checks and all that stuff. But it did make it, it made it through. So we can get through these things so we have to be thinking about how we go about those. I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a site out there that I think is still probably vulnerable. Same type of thing, except for it didn't really work with negatives. It wouldn't credit your account uh, because of the way the site worked. But back in the day when I was writing ASP Classic applications, I love those days, we wrote an e-commerce site that the price was a hidden field. And sure enough, if you grab that request and you change the price, it would accept it. And it would, you, you, you know, hey, it's $24.99. Nah, I'm gonna pay $2.99 for this. And sure enough, you pay $2.99, right? Now, hopefully you have a check on the back end that would catch that, but maybe not. And there was a story of a guy, this had, and this was years ago, that, that got caught doing this. And I don't know the outcome, but he was, he was brought into court for it. And, like I said, I don't know the outcome, but he basically tried to use it as he was negotiating with the server, <laughs> right? Because, well, you said 24, I said five, you said okay. That's legit, right? I don't think, I don't think it worked out like he thought it was going to. <laughs> but I thought this is genius, right? Like I love the, the idea that you're going with here, right? This is how hackers think is they look at it from a whole different perspective. Like how can I 
abuse the system. You know, another example, I don't have it in my slides, but uh, eBay a long time ago had this problem uh, with lockouts, with their account lockouts. Because what people would do is eBay, when they first started, they would display the username of the other people bidding on the same stuff you were bidding on. So the smart guys got real smart, and they said, well, two minutes, five minutes before the bidding ends, I'll go lock their accounts out. <laughs> and they'd go, whoops, uh, they'd go lock all their accounts out, and they're the only one left to put that final bid in there. Right? And so they stopped displaying usernames on there. <laughs> but this is stuff, we don't think about that from a development standpoint. We think, you know what, ease of use, let me display the username to be able to see this. Right? And that, that's how we look at things. And that's how we gotta start looking at it a little bit different. Um, I already talked a little bit about combining different sources a little bit. You know, I mean, the example of we use web, Windows, mobile, uh, you know, those kind of work together. MySpace had the problem uh, where their web app did a great job but the mobile app let stuff in to be able to do that. Uh, I actually had a test I just did recently with a client where their APIs, the way they were doing authentication and setting up authorization, um, you know, they had an API that took a specific key from their mobile device and would let you set your authorizations. I'd like to be admin today. And it would take it, right? I mean, it's like, oh, what's the mobile app? Sure, let it set whatever. It's hard coded except we could go in and decode the mobile app, look at the source, find the code, and then we use that code to then request our own scopes, which those scopes then gave us admin access to the web application, right? And so it's not just our web app or just our mobile app, right? We're taking pieces from all over, right? If I'm gonna attack an application, I'm not just looking at the app. I'm gonna research your company. I'm gonna you know, look into what other type of apps do you have? Do you have code out on GitHub? Right, I mean, look, a developer writing over here, writing an encryption algorithm, if he's got code over here with encryption algorithms, there's a chance he may be using the same one. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna look at that type of stuff, right? So we're looking outside the box. We're not just looking at what exists in there. I like to say security by security never works. Uh, I worked at one company. We actually had cross-site scripting on a page and it was up in the URL. It was from a menu, right? They display a menu, you click the menu, it takes you to another page, it displays the title of the page based on a query string value, and we could do cross-site scripting. I alerted them about this, uh, and their answer was, well, we'll just encrypt the query string. Ah, that's great, but you have a page that lets me set that title before it gets encrypted, so you're still vulnerable. Had you listened to me, you would have just encoded the output. But, we often do things just to, to quickly do it. It caused way other problems too. They were using jQuery on the page and now all of a sudden their value that they expected in jQuery was encrypted. So then they were gonna start writing a API that they could call to pass the encrypted string up to get the decrypted value and I was like, that's even worse. <laughs> like really, you're gonna give me an API call to decrypt any data you put in your system. This, is, this seems bad. All right, so <laughs> we wanna think about that a little bit when we're putting this stuff together. You know, understand that you know, menu is an authorization option, not good. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next sl slide. But uh, you know, understand like, the skill sets we're looking for, understand it, and you know, everything that's going on here that we can't have that, right? We can't just blatantly go out there and, and, and assume people can't see things. So the super secret admin pages, as I was just mentioning, Right, how many people have done where they do their authorization to administrative sites based on whether I'm gonna show you those items in the menu or not? And I see a lot of sites that do this. You know, if I'm an admin, I log in, I see a whole bunch more menu items. Well, the problem is, is that a lot of places use that as your author authorization. So if I'm not an admin, I just don't see those links. And they're like, oh great, you know, non-admins don't see that. But as testers and as hackers, we figure that stuff out. One, mostly because you actually name the pages something common, like add role, <laughs> add user, those type of things, so we can guess some of those pages. But we can figure those out. We can't assume we can't see those pages. So instead of doing authorization via the menu, we actually want that when I click that link and I go to load that page, now's where we need to do the authorization. Here's where I need to see it because if you're not checking it at the actual page level, we're gonna find a way to bypass that, right? So just understanding, you know, it's, it's easy to do it one way, but better to do it the other, because it will be found. I mean, everything out there, I mean, everybody see the, the key for 
the Microsoft boot system that just got released and everybody's talking about we can't have, uh, this is why we can't have cryptographic backdoors, right? I mean, a screenshot of something out there on the web released a key that will unlock your bootloader. So now on your Windows devices, you can load other operating systems. Uh, so obscurity doesn't really work there. We have to get better at doing that. We need to understand our frameworks <clears throat> that we're using, right? It doesn't matter what you're using, but we have to understand what they're capable of. And all the, the frameworks are different. Uh, you know, I mean, like I said, I come from more of a WinForm, WebForm, .NET background, um, but even from an MVC side, right? If you understand the technologies that exist within your framework, you're going to have a leg up. You know, and I'll use .NET as an example, especially the WebForm side, right? You've got things like request validation, .NET developers, you heard of request validation? Right? These are things that are there. This helps lower the likelihood of cross-site scripting in your app, right? But when you submit a request, it looks at it, and it's looking for the less than symbol followed by a character, right? There's a couple, there's, there's not really a lot that it looks for, but it's trying to, to pull out HTML contact cross-site scripting for you. It's not the best, it's bypassable, but it's good that we know it's there, it's good that we know the limits of it so that we can understand if we can bypass it or not. <coughs> you know, uh, event validation, things like that, view state Mac, that exist in web forms, right? These things, if we understand how they work, we understand how they save us, right? So we have to, have to understand that. <clears throat> so with our third parties, you know, understanding the strengths and weaknesses, right? If I'm using something that's really strong with SQL and it's not as susceptible to SQL injection, that's good, but I wanna make sure I use it properly for that. If I'm using a front end that's really good at protecting its cross-site scripting, like Razor does a good job, a bunch of the new front ends, frameworks do good jobs of protecting against cross-site scripting unless you do something out of the norm. Well, then cross-site scripting is not as much a concern for me. I only need to know don't do this versus don't do this. You know, you go back and look at .NET uh, web forms. <laughs> I mean, if you're using server-side controls, you know, text boxes auto-encode their data, but labels don't, right? So a text box is difficult to cross-site script, but a label's easy. But if you don't know that difference, and there's a whole list, I mean, it's huge of a bunch of the controls and whether they auto-encode or not, right, we've gotten a lot better, right? Razor, it's, hey, do you use raw HTML? No, then you're pretty much good, right? I mean, and so we've gotten a lot better at that, but we have to understand that from our tools. But keep them up to date, right? Keep the patches going. Uh, you know, you look at things like Ruby, who patches all the time. <laughs> there's all kinds of updates to Ruby. There's all kinds of updates to things like jQuery and, and these other items. You know, check that out. And if you use Burp, which is pretty cool, um, they actually have a plugin that you can get called Retired JS, and it looks at all these different JS frameworks and will tell you on your site, hey, you're using an outdated version of jQuery, or you're using an outdated version of Knockout, and we know that there's vulnerabilities in these parts, right? So that way you're at least aware that those are there. Uh, and an example of one that had an issue, um, Angular JS, which actually does a pretty good job. Um, in their templating system, I actually had this come up while I was doing an assessment. Um, they were using client-side templates. Well, with templates, you can use expressions, right? And this is different. Most of the time when we talk about cross-site scripting, we're talking about angle brackets, right? We're talking about putting like script tags and all that. No, here we're using the curly braces, which indicate our expressions that we want to execute. And we're actually able to bypass and break out of their sandbox and execute JavaScript code in Angular. Now this is an older version of Angular, uh, but this link down here actually, and email me if you want it, uh, they actually go through like all the different versions of Angular and how you can break out of the sandbox um, and, and some cool ways around it. So it's pretty neat, but it goes out of our norm, right? So normally we're selling people, hey, don't do this, right? Don't let angle brackets out, don't let this out, don't let that out. Rarely do we ever cover curly braces. No output encoding does curly braces. Right, they do the double quotes, they do these other items. Right, so unless you're using whitelisting, you're gonna be susceptible to this. Downside is you can't encode those. <laughs> Even if you encode them, the expression will still work, as I found out when I was researching this. Right, so we have to understand what we do. You have to remove them. Like if you don't want expressions to work from a user, get rid of those. That'll solve the problem, right? I mean, but we have to figure that stuff out and understand it. But if we didn't understand our frameworks, then we wouldn't understand like, things about how expressions work and how they're evaluated. Logging and auditing, right? This is another big one that, that we often overlook, right? How many people, when they log in their application, what are you logging? Typically debug information, right? It's for troubleshooting. Oh, I had an error here, right? View state error, 
event validation error, maybe you get login errors. All right, but mostly what we're doing is we're logging those type of bugs. And security is a bug, don't get me wrong, but we're typically logging the, the debugging type of bugs so we can figure out how to fix our applications and get them going. But really we need to think about all kinds of other things, right? Who's accessing our data? When are they accessing our data? How often are they accessing our data? Right? You might have logging requirements and go into your corporations. If you work in an enterprise, there's probably logging requirements of the type of stuff. But we need to know, you know, authentication, authentication succeeds, authentication fails, access to private information. Because not only can we use this information to help us out when we're trying to block this type of stuff, right? Hey, I just ran SQL map, <laughs> block my IP address. We can use it for that type of thing, but it also comes in handy if an event actually happens to where incident response comes in, we start doing forensics on things. They want to be able to see logs of how was the application used? Did somebody change you know, and log in as somebody else or access an account they weren't supposed to access to? So if you get somebody accessing a bank account they're not supposed to access, Right? That should be logged. Hey, this person tried to, failed logging this. Right? Doesn't mean we're always taking action, but at least we're logging the fact that it's there. Um, but typically when I talk to people, that's what we're logging. Right? We're logging debug issues. We're not logging security events. You know, so getting in with your organization, understand, you know, is there a central SIM that you guys are logging to? How do we log to it? Um, just thinking about more than just our little piece of the pie is what we're doing. Um, so, I will tell you, security is not rocket science. Uh, if I can do it, that says a lot. Um, <laughs> we like to say it's this, right? From a security realm, we like to look at it as security is really difficult, security is really hard, you guys can't figure it out. It's not true, right? It's not that difficult. Most of the stuff that we're finding is not hard to find, we just happen to be looking for it. And as you saw through, hopefully, through a bunch of these examples, they weren't really complex situations, they were kind of simple things that just kind of were oversights, right? We, use the menu for authorization instead of this. We did that instead of that. You know, we're not checking our hidden fields or our parameters that are coming up before we access them. Right? It's simple stuff like that. We're not doing anything complex to get in for any of these breaks that we do. You know, some of them require some extra steps. I might have to require do some Python scripting to make some stuff faster. But it's, it's, really, it's, it's really the simple stuff that we're fighting for there. Uh, stuff that we can all do, and that's something I push for app teams is you can do some of this testing and do the secure coding. Um, it, it doesn't take some sort of security degree to be able to do a lot of this stuff. So tips to leave you with on this, right? Understand the concepts, you know, and when I say that, I mean, you know, understand like input validation, output encoding. You know, when I talk about SQL injection, cross-site scripting, OS command injection, all these things, right? They're input validation, they're output encoding. And if you understand those concepts and you understand that whether I'm going to a SQL server, whether I'm going to a mail server, whether I'm going to the browser, that I have to do X, Y, and Z to properly send that data over there, then you don't have to be a SQL injection master and an OS command. All you know is, it doesn't matter what system I call, this is how we should be calling this, right? You read the docs, we know this is how it's done. SMTP, I know we got to encode these characters, right? Or SQL injection, let's use parameterized queries, or we got to encode these special parameters. It's just understanding those concepts. Same thing, authentication, authorization. Be wary of your untrusted data. You know, um, there's a lot of untrusted data out there, and like I showed on the trust boundaries chart, right? Think about that it's more than just what the user can put up there, but databases, all that stuff. People overlook that all too often. Consider your abuse cases. Don't just look at something as how does this work for my client? How does this solve the problem? But how could this be used? Right? I've got a simple messaging form. Could I use that as an open mail relay? Could I do something with that that I shouldn't be able to do? You know, I've got a database query. Could that actually give me access to other stuff if somebody abused that? Um, think about those type of things and embrace your security practices that you have going on. You know, build them up internally. You know, make this part of your everyday routine. It shouldn't be slowing you down, but it should be part of the thought process you're using to go through and building your applications, whether it's business analysts, whether it's development, whether it's testing, whether it's app owners, we should be thinking about what's the implications of when we release this software, how could it be used, how could it be abused, and what are we doing to help protect ourselves against that. So that's everything for this, right on the dot at nine o'clock.